is the future of food being fueled by Silicon Valley? Investigative journalist and author Larissa Zimbaroff digs into that question in her book, Technically Food. Featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Time, Bloomberg Business Week, and more, Zimbaroff looks at how real food is being replaced with high tech. Protein from peas, greens grown without the sun, and eggs created without a chicken. Is the new food hype really all it's cracked up to be? Please welcome Larissa Zimbaroff. Thanks, everyone. It's great to see so many faces. And it's such a treat to be in person at a conference. I've had so many uh, Zooms and virtuals. I'm ready to be in person again. And now I bet you're all wondering why a tech writer is at the Organic Produce Summit. I wondered the same thing when Matt invited me. I promise I'm not here to convince you to buy robots or install cameras on your retail shelves or make plants into meat. But I am here to try to connect food tech to organics and figure out ways that you could learn from them. <clears throat> we are at the crossroads of a truly interesting time. And I'm not just referring to this 18 months of um, the pandemic that forced us all inside and we all gained maybe the COVID-18. The organic produce business is booming. You're up 11%, but plant-based foods is up 27%. You're still winning a market share, but they're coming for you. So what fueled the uptick? First, it was the pandemic. In between rushing for toilet paper and the last bottle of hand sanitizer, we also ran to the market to get organics. Um, the second thing was, oh, so how many of you felt that what you were doing was critical to helping the country fight this pandemic? You guys got food, right, raise your hands. You guys were critical to making sure that we were still eating, right? You were essential businesses. For Bloomberg, I wrote a story about farmers markets and when they, they were determined to be essential, I, I ran over there and supported them, right? Those farmers lost all of their food service instantly. So, so the second reason was that we're all finally waking up to climate problems. This includes drier winters, hotter summers, and if you live in California like me, fires in September. According to food tech startups, Traditional agriculture is antiquated. Soil, acres of land, animals grazing on the land, it's the sun. These are ruining the environment, they say, and they're, cap and they're not capable of feeding enough people. Food tech startups raised over $30 billion last year, and founders want to overhaul what they say is bad about our food system. Are they talking about what's good about our food system? Are they talking about organics? Nope. I'm here to tell you why you should care about what these vegan founders are doing and what it might mean for growers and retailers. I interviewed over 100 people for my book so that I could understand how our food was changing and what it might mean for us. And because I need to know everything, I tried it all. What I learned may surprise you. Egg protein made without chickens, cow, uh, whey protein made without cows, milk made from pea protein blitzed up in a centrifuge. Food science has always been part of getting food to the table, but it's leaping ahead of us in so many ways that many of us won't even be able to keep up. The organic community can't sit back and relax. You need to pay attention, you need to track the trend, trends, and you need to adapt. My talk will focus on three chapters from my book, upcycling, uh, burger wars, vertical farms, and upcycling. These are forward thinking categories that I think you guys can learn from and maybe leverage. Let's start with the burger wars. How, it's so hard to see you guys. I wish I could see you better. How many of you have tried a plant-based burger? Okay, that's not as many as I thought. What's going on people? <sighs> okay, well, they're out there and they're ready for you to try them. So the company names promise us greatness, impossible foods, beyond meat, everything legendary, sweet earth. There's a burger war and it's going on between privately funded companies with tons of cash in the bank and publicly funded companies with Wall Street's backing. What they're, what they're fighting, while they're fighting over market share between each other, they're also stealing your market share. These new foods offer convenience and healthy plant-based protein. They make us feel like we're doing something good for the planet 
what they're also doing is distracting us from eating real food, from eating organic food. As I point out in my book, most of these burgers are made from over a dozen ingredients. They want us to believe they're made out of plants, but they're made out of plants that grow from the earth in the same way that a Slim Jim is coming from a cow. <laughs> the biggest company is Impossible Foods and they're using GMO ingredients. But they're, and Beyond Meat is using peas grown in the North America, but they're not organic. These companies claim to want to be sustainable, to rescue our environment, to help the climate, to save us from our eventual doom, <clears throat> but they're not using organic foods. So where's the beef? Beyond Meat is using pea, rice, and mung bean protein. Again, much grown in North America, but it's not organic. They've got gels, binders, and starches, and they also, it also has coconut oil, which is a saturated fat and not something we're supposed to be you know, downing. They're also, do you see these peas in the corner? These like really lush, fresh looking green peas? That's not what's in the burger. They're using yellow field peas, not those green peas. Those green peas are selling are false advertising. It'd be like one of you guys using a, a picture of kale on a bag of corn chips. Impossible Foods is using GMO soy and potato protein. It has the same gels and binders and coconut oil, which like I said, we're told to watch. Impossible Foods is using, <clears throat> is using a, an additional GMO ingredient that is for flavor and taste. And this is made for them by DuPont. Now DuPont is famous for making Teflon pans that use the chemical ingredient that leached into our drinking water. So now we're okay with DuPont making ingredients for our food. If these companies, companies wanted to be truly sustainable, they'd be using organic foods in their products and they're not. Right now, it's because of price and ease of supply chain. If the organic community could talk louder about how these startups aren't supporting organics, maybe we can chip away at their shiny techno armor. Maybe we can get Beyond Meat to use organic peas grown in the United States. Veggie burgers haven't been delicious for decades. Our beloved burger was an easy target for startups to remake and to pitch to investors. Beyond Meat's IPO was the second largest in the last decade. If anybody is a stock buyer here, hopefully you got in on Beyond Meat because their stock's doing really well. Impossible Foods is considering an IPO and is valued at over $10 billion. By offering up convenience and the promise of plant-based protein, these burgers are new and exciting. Consumers like that. Plus we're told it's a healthy form of protein. If protein is what we're looking for, why not put that on the pack? Why not put what kale and blueberries have in protein content on the pack? Well, you can read the back of a box of a, of a burger, what I, what I, but you won't know how it's made. If I look at peas, I fundamentally know how peas are grown. I think I'll get a better number here. You guys know how peas are grown? Okay, great. I got one yes. Awesome. <laughs> Does anyone here know how pea protein isolate is made? No. Nobody, exactly. It's usually made in China, it's fractionated, which means that the components of the pea are separated out and only the protein is used in the burger. No longer has its vitamins. Peas are high in vitamin A, C, and K, and it has almost everything we need in vitamins and minerals. Peas also have fiber, which is missing from the American diet, but none of that goes to the burger. Organics can increase market share when it tells buyers exactly what is in their foods. The seeds, the growing conditions, the soil, the farmer's name, the worker's conditions. By being ever more transparent, the organic community can show off how they have nothing to hide. Unlike tech startups that have everything to hide. Now there's some stars in produce like the Sumo Orange and the Cutie Mandarin, the Mandarin Cutie, I'm the rose, I had the rosé berry yesterday from Driscoll's. It really blew my mind. We need more of those products that excite consumers. I track the Sumo like it's Ryan Gosling. I hunt it down. <laughs> Along with taste, for today's consumer wants convenience. How can organics leverage this potential? Take this example. This is really delicious. It's called the Actual Green Burger, and the company's name is Actual Veggies. What's in it? Veggies, that's it. Kale, 
peas, navy beans, parsnips, oats, hemp seeds, quinoa. A product like this could be made at any farm growing multiple vegetables. Or a chef could sponsor a burger like this and put his favorite farm's products in it. Now, next, next sector. This next sector thinks it can do what you do, but better. We need to feed 8 billion people and the competition presents that we need to grow in every possible way. Vertical farms are almost universally not profitable, yet investors are throwing millions at them. Before I dig into what this means, a quick primer on what I'm talking about. A vertical farm grows in trays stacked high to the ceiling. It grows in vertical towers. It grows uh, with costly LED lighting instead of the sun, which last time I checked was free. They use a potting medium instead of soil. They use robotics instead of humans. Now, oh, now these quotes are from Nate Story, who's at Plenty. I interviewed Nate several times for my book. And Plenty is trying to reinvent the wheel. Plenty is located um, near the SFO. They're trying to reinvent the wheel and grow more faster. And they started with leafy greens because leafy greens are quick to turn over. They can grow in weeks. They present that their indoor farms can pop up all around the world and get fresh food to market faster. Now, Nate told me that he was growing the best tomatoes he'd ever tasted in his life. And this is a man that was trained with soil. He said he could do it 365 days a year. He's also growing berries and with the help of Driscoll's who really knows their berries. Um, I haven't tried either the tomato or the berry. No one's ready to let me, I tried. And you know why? It's because genetics indoors are hard and because pollination and the sun aren't made to be in the indoors. Nevertheless, imagine if more people like Nate were working towards organics. Imagine if more money was being fueled to or organics and helping to change the soil, change growing techniques and help the industry grow bigger. Farm tech raised almost 8 billion last year. Most of that from indoor farms and bugs. I'll save bugs for the next OPS bug summit. Now, a few of the, a few of the big, biggest fundraise funding, funded so far are App Harvest, Plenty, Bowery Farming, and Aero Farms. You saw uh, Mark Oshima on the panel this morning. Aero Farms is going public soon, so their number is a little low right now, but it's going to go big. There will be a day, though, when the money will, and investment will drop away. In 2019, almost 600 indoor farms filed Chapter 12. This includes all indoor models. Despite that, the sector is expected to hit almost 18 billion by 2028, but it will take merger, mergers and acquisitions to get there and more bankruptcies. Every company wants to say they're doing better by the planet. The organic community needs to focus on who is doing it better right now. Vertical farms don't grow in traditional soil, but they make claims that they produce the cleanest possible food that they're non-GMO and they're locally grown and pesticide free. They use nutritional data from the USDA, but not from their own crops. And most of their farmers are robotic arms and sensors. Despite these obvious differences, the USDA says that indoor farms can use the organic label if they meet all of their standards. Will this water down the organic label? Can the organic industry convince vertical farms to use their own label? Do consumers know the difference between what they're buying? The greens grown in vertical farms are, entirely, are an entirely new category of food. My personal favorite is lacinato kale. It's, it's deep, it's thick, it's got tons of fiber. You guys already know I love fiber. Baby kale, which comes from indoor farms, has none of that fiber. Imagine making a smoothie with baby kale versus lacinato kale. On July 15th, Bright Farms, an indoor farm on the East Coast, filed a voluntary recall. Its leafy greens had a salmonella contamination. Now, one of, the, one of the narratives is that indoor farms are safer and cleaner. Now, Bright Farms is growing in soil indoors, so it's not the, 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 it's not the vertical farm I'm talking about, but the point is that indoor farm isn't perfect, right? And it has its problems. And the organic industry should pay attention to that and make sure that they keep positioning themselves as different. Here's a story. So Mark Corzelius, he's the chief strategy officer of And Ever Farms. It's a Germany-based Germany company, a vertical farm company 
that needed acquisition. They tried to open a farm in Kuwait. There was no training, no people there that could run the farm and they needed financial support. They were just acquired by Calera, which is in Florida. Mark talked to me about going to shopping in Manhattan for greens. And he went to uh, the Whole Foods in Columbus Circle. Now, if you can imagine the most Manhattan-y experience of shopping, it's the, it's the Whole Foods at Columbus Circle. <clears throat> it's marble, it's got per se on the top floor. I mean, it is ritzy. So he took the escalator down and he sees a wall of tubs of plastic green, wrapped greens. And above it, it says locally grown. Now, two things. He knows that it's not all local. And he knows he doesn't want to just be another tub of greens. So he comes up with a different idea. And his idea is harvest on demand. Consumers get this like little pallet of greens. And when they're ready to have it for dinner, they cut their greens. It's arguably fresher and the nutritional data is higher. What can organics do that's like this? I know that sometimes I see, you know, maybe a butterhead lettuce with the root still on. I know that Shenandoah has their herbs and dirt. It's great. I hate getting herbs in plastic, but what else? What else can be done? I'm finally seeing tomatoes and blueberries in cardboard boxes, but what's the next packaging innovation? When will we see compostable lettuce bags? What about branded salad mixes with chefs and restaurants? Tech startups are leaning on chefs to get them into their home, into homes. How can organics do more with chefs? What's your fresh frozen innovation? How can you convey healthfulness even in the frozen aisle, which is booming by the way. Consumers are looking for new innovations to help improve their health. 79% of global consumers are trying to improve their diet. Organics need to stay one step ahead. There might have been a day when we could glance at the produce section of the supermarket and see unpackaged greens and know that they came from a farm and what that farm looked like. What the where, where the farm was didn't really matter. Then came plastic bags and tubs. Then we, that meant we could learn more. But did we look? You know, when I'm reaching for packaged foods, I might look at the back. But if I'm reaching for a bag of spinach, I know it's one ingredient. Why do I need to know more? How do you differentiate in that situation? Maybe, maybe organics can partner with QSR. Food service is a tough sell. Most chefs tell me they buy local over organic. It's cheaper. Could the organic community use food service as a Trojan horse of sorts? Take Suvla. It's a very popular salad chain in the Bay Area. They recently announced that Delta Airlines will be serving their salad on their planes, long haul flights into New York. Could an organic, could organic, are any of their greens organic? Nope. Could organic farms partner with Subla to get their names on the menu? Absolutely. You have like a captured audience on a plane eating a salad that's delicious. So third, third chapter, upcycling. I have more than three chapters in my book, but these are the ones I thought you might like. Third chapter is upcycling, and it refers to food, using food waste. And this isn't going to come as, to, as news to you, but we waste a big chunk of food along the supply chain at the farm, at the retailer, and at home. It's estimated that 42 million people may experience hunger this year. The USDA says we waste anywhere from 30 to 40% of the food we grow. That's $161 billion in food waste or 108 billion pounds of food. We, still we all toss out food that's still edible. And this is where the idea of upcycling comes in. Upcycling is also called industrial symbiosis, where waste from one company is used by another company. The ultimate goal is not to waste anything. And you know, I love, Shenandoah has this new stat from their change in how they're growing, where they're wasting less, less of their herbs. It's amazing. I think he said it was like 98%. Phil, if you're here. Anyway, um, so how do we waste less? And also, Walter Robb, he calls it lost food. I heard him set, re reference it this way at Expo West in 2019. And lost food is food we can still get back. So here are two examples of upcycled foods. They're both made from spent grains, uh, spent grains from beer making. One is a milk made from barley, and one is corn puffs made from corn and barley. Beer brewers waste an, an inordinate amount of spent grains. Some of it makes it to a farm. Most of it is, goes to the waste stream. Um, another example is about Caitlin Mogentel. Caitlin Mogentel 
lives in Los Angeles. And you know what's big in Los Angeles? Juicing. She noticed tons of waste from juicing. Dan Barber also noticed this too. I think he talked two years ago. He made a burger out of it. But Caitlin, initially she made granola and she sold it at farmer's markets. Tiny little bags of granola, precious little granola in LA. And she realized that was gonna do nothing. So then she figured out chips. So how does she do it? She partnered with Suja Juice, which this year will have 185 million in sales. Just imagine the waste that this company has. She gets kale and celery pulp from them. They, they freeze it. She picks it up in a refrigerated truck, takes it to her plant. She mixes it with other ingredients and within one to two days. It's mixed with uh, chia, okara, cassava. She bakes the chips, fries them, and then they have a year shelf life. It's called pulp, pulp pantry. They are honestly delicious and you're eating them and you know what you're getting? Fiber. <laughs> I spend a lot of time talking about fiber. It's, I think it's like my cause. I'm like, I have this like passion to make fiber sexy. We all need more fiber. Personally, I need fiber because I have type one diabetes. Fiber helps food have a lower glycemic impact on my blood sugar. So I like to eat whole food, but I also write about tech. So there's this tension here because I'm excited about innovation, but I like to eat from the natural world. I think that organics can, can figure out the same thing, the same tension and get, and get ahead of it. Here are some stats. I really like these and these are about upcycling. In 2017, Drexel University released a study on the benefits of upcycling. Researchers noted that consumers forego personal gains if they feel that purchasing pro-environmental products will contribute to the welfare of society. In 2019, Matson released data showing that 39% of consumers plan to buy more food and beverages using upcycled ingredients. In a study of 2,000 adults, 86% of respondents said that they would continue to consider the importance of sustainability even after the pandemic subsides. In the same study, 37% of Americans are willing to pay a little more for sustainable products even during an economic downturn. Gen Z is actually the most willing at 43%. This means that the money that it's gonna to take to go compostable is worth it. We're willing to spend the money. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Hopefully you're reading this slide behind me. In terms of benefits, upcycled foods provide significantly higher self benefits than conventional. But what beats both of them is organic. So what can we do with this? We can make organic upcycled foods. In a retail environment, locations can collaborate with local jam makers, bakers, and other cottage food industries makers. The more local, the better. Alerts could go out daily with like what fruits and vegetables needed to be picked up. Each party wins. Small businesses get low to no cost foods. Retailers save money on their waste stream. And they have a unique message to take to the community. Investors want to see a tangible product. By dealing with their waste, and creating products, the organic community will have a reason to get investment from VCs that want solutions. To them, a farm or head of broccoli isn't a product, but food, CPG products, as we've seen from Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods and maybe actual veggies will get there, they are things that will convince VCs to give them money. Here's some examples. Tomato jerky made at a tomato farm. Mushroom jerky could be made at any of the mushroom growers in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, upcycled cookies made from okara flour. Okara comes from uh, tofu making and banana bites. These are made um, at site. They're in third world uh, developing countries that grow bananas and they're making, taking all the waste and making banana bites. 80% of consumers believe that food, drink and supplement brands should be doing more to protect the environment. So in closing, one thing technology startups aren't doing is making a better carrot. There may be some folks tinkering with making a better tomato. I know I've mentioned them, but Driscoll's is tinkering with making better strawberries and raspberries and blackberries. But organics is in the lead and you need to stay there. Outside of the transportation bill, the climate is where everyone is focused. Here's where you can shine brighter. Show how you're using regenerative organic systems to make farms better year after year. Show how these methods support an ecosystem that benefits the workers, the community and eaters. 
show that organics has better flavor and nutrition and share in ever more transparent ways. Get funding in order to improve your businesses, whether that's growing better, better soil management, land management, you name it, water management. Create value-added products from food waste at the farm or at the market. Partner with the USDA and the Upcycle Foods Association to see what's possible. There are 8 billion people to feed in the world and a pandemic that is still going around. Outside of vaccinating everyone on the planet, the best, the best thing we can do is feed them organic food. Thank you.